there, Seaside Shadows. This is Laura, your local historian here, and I am here to tell you all about Isabella Beecher Hooker. You'll see I am here in the beautiful Cedar Hill Cemetery. This is the Hooker Memorial, and we have Isabella Beecher Hooker here with her husband, John Hooker. Now, Isabella Hooker was born, as you can see, in 1822. She was born to Reverend Lyman Beecher and his second wife, Harriet Porter. Reverend Lyman was a Yale graduate, a Presbyterian minister, and a co-founder of the American Temperance Society. The family were radical free thinkers. Now, this means the children were taught to think for themselves, but unfortunately, what that means the children did not always think the same as their father. Now, the father himself was a very interesting man. Now, the American Temperance Society means that he was not too fond of the drink. So this man did become famous for a number of sermons he made about dangers of intoxication. But perhaps one of his most famous of all was one that was made just two years after a very infamous duel the one between Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. He made a very scathing sermon about the evils of dueling, which spread across the United States. Now you have to remember, Aaron Burr was still somewhat in hiding after his duel. So of course, people were not taking very kindly to him at this point still. So they did take too kindly to the sermon. But they did like his sermons, they did like the dueling, they did like the intoxication. And they did catch the attention of many ministries across the land. The Presbyterians thought that he was just the kind of man that they liked. So they invited him to come to Cincinnati, kind of the hub of the Presbyterians at that time. They said, would you like to come and teach the future Presbyterian ministers of the United States? To which he said, well, I've already been doing that for a while and I'm worried about the future of my family. Now, it is prudent to say at this time that Reverend Lyman Beecher did have quite a number of wives. Now, Isabella was the daughter of the second wife. He did have three wives and he had 13 children, nine of which grew on to be very successful authors. Now with all these children, he did need a way to support them. So he did decline the offer in Cincinnati. They came back a second time with a better offer. The equivalent in today's money of almost $1 million a year to teach the future Presbyterians of America, to which he said yes, and he moved the children from where they were in Litchfield, when they were in Boston for a while, then to Cincinnati, and they had, did have a good time there. But unfortunately, Reverend Lyman Beecher did have very strong abolitionist views, and these did not sit too well in Ohio. Unfortunately, that was kind of the center ground of the Underground Railroad, and a lot of people, when the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, were sending these escaped slaves back. So he decided it was time to leave Cincinnati. He did eventually go back to Brooklyn, New York, where his beloved son, Henry Ward Beecher was, and he passed away at his side in Brooklyn. Now, we do need to talk about Isabella and her siblings, where they became famous in their own right. And it was actually many of the women that were famous. Of course, the most famous of which is Harriet Beecher Stowe. You will see that she does have a museum in Hartford to this day, which you can visit. She's most famous because of Uncle Tom's Cabin, of course, which many of you have probably read. It's a very famous book that was very well known for its anti-slavery message. It has the abolitionist message that her father had instilled in her. But interestingly enough, while she had this message of anti-slavery and was against abolition and the enslavement of people and the oppression of people, she did have some rather odd views of other things. So while she attacked the South for their cruelties, she also supported the Highland Clearances in Scotland, calling them sublime and benevolent. So it seems that there is a quite a few different sides. But as one of the sons of the Reverend said, my father was largely engaged during his lifetime in controversy. It seems that his children did not escape that either. Now, we also have Henry Ward Beecher, his beloved son. He was a very skilled orator. He was also a bit unusual 
for his support of the women's suffrage movement, at that time something that was considered unusual for a man, especially in the 19th century, but he also didn't inherit his father's views on abolition. Now his scandal was one of adultery, although this was considered something of slander because the person that did start this rumor was someone who was upset with him because he had criticized them in a sermon, so probably not something that had any merit. Then there was Catherine Beecher, who was the eldest child of Reverend Lyman Beecher. She was a bit unusual because she was a trailblazer. She was an early advocate for women's education. She started the Hartford Female Seminary in Hartford, and it was one of the first major institutions for women. But at the same time, she didn't believe in women's suffrage at all. She believed that a woman's place was either as a mother or as a teacher. There was no in-between for women, and she did not believe that they had any rights, or indeed they should have the right to vote at all. There was also Thomas Beecher, and Thomas Beecher was actually best friends with Mark Twain himself. He was the officiant at Mark Twain's wedding, and he even married the granddaughter of Noah Webster, so he was basically Connecticut royalty. So we have some very famous siblings in the family, but of course, Isabella herself is famous in her own right. So we have the last name of Hooker. We see that she did marry John Hooker, the descendant of the Hooker family who founded Connecticut. But Isabella, before all that, was quite a simple girl. She went to school until she was 16 years old, but she was not very satisfied with that. In fact, she did write in her diary that she was very upset that she did not get to go to school for longer. All the other boys in her family got to go on to college. Why didn't she? And in fact, when she met John, she did like him very much. But in a letter, she did question, would she be equal to him when they got married? So she did have some hesitations, even early on as a teenager. But there were some doubts as to her belief in women's suffrage and in abolition itself, for she was under the influence of her sister Catherine, who I just spoke of. Catherine was 22 years older than her. Because Isabella's own mother had died when she was a teenager, Catherine stepped in as a surrogate mother. Because she was older than her and unmarried, she took the place of her mother and took her under her wing. She told her all about the evils of women's suffrage and women's rights and the evils of abolition, and Isabella tended to believe her. So when she met John, and John revealed his abolitionist views and his views on women's suffrage, she thought he was nuts. She wasn't so into it. John himself had worked on the Amistad case in New London. She wasn't so keen on that. But as time went on, she started to get worn down, and eventually, by the time she was 19, John read her a passage from a law book. He said, you know, the husband has power over a wife. They are considered one. The wife is the same as the husband, husband not the same as the wife. And to her, that was kind of the final straw. She started questioning why that was so, and she became a bit enraged by this. In fact, she wrote about it in her autobiography. She wrote that the passage had made her think about the beginning of her activism. And although she had spent the 25 years of her life raising three children, she hated being a simple wife and mother. And although she loved her husband, she did not like the fact that he did not help with any of the child rearing, which was not unusual in the 19th century. She also did not like the fact that she felt she was constrained by the fact that she was married. She had to stay at home and raise the children, and she did write down in her diary that at one point she was so frustrated early on in the marriage that she could not simply sit down and read a book. She felt that intellectually she was constrained and socially she was constrained, and in fact she felt that she just couldn't take it anymore. But it seems that in her confinement she found freedom, for she did suffer from several medical conditions but that was her escape. For she was a wealthy woman, and she was able to escape to medical resorts and spas for her treatment. She took this as an opportunity for months on end to escape to different states, and she would spend four, five, six months away from her family at a time. And this is when she truly thrived. She would spend her time studying, she would spend her time researching, and this is when she started her activism. 
This is when she started realizing it was time for her to start advocating for women's suffrage. And after one of these stays, she became inspired. This is what she wrote in her autobiography. Frances Ellen Burr had already introduced a bill to the Connecticut legislature in 1867 to allow women the right to vote, but it was defeated by a vote of 111 to 93. I became so interested that in 1868, I wrote a mother's letter to a daughter on women's suffrage, which was published anonymously in Putnam's Monthly. They seemed to be of some interest and it was popularly believed they were written by some of the Massachusetts clique. It was at this time that Reverend Dr. Horace Bushnell, a longtime acquaintance and neighbor of ours, presented me with a copy of his book, Women's Suffrage, The Reform Against Nature. While I am sure he meant no ill will by giving me this token, its arguments seem so illogical to me and its conclusions so entrenched in myth that I was even more determined to enter the fray on behalf of women's rights. When she wrote this anonymous piece, it blew up and it went across the United States. She wrote in it that her main point was, women would raise the moral level of politics and bring a motherly wisdom to the affairs of the gov government. She had a much more gentle approach to a lot of the women's suffrage. She did not so much believe in women's rights so much as just the right to vote. She attended the conventions in Boston and New York, and she eventually became friends with, as I have mentioned before in my previous videos, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. She also co-founded the New England Women's Suffrage Association, the Connecticut Women Association, and the Society for the Study of Political Science. She was one smart cookie. She followed up with a petition to the Connecticut General Assembly. She wrote and she petitioned a bill that provided married women with property rights. The bill was of course rejected time and time again, but every single year she petitioned them and finally in 1877, it was passed. In 1870, she began a national tour on behalf of women's suffrage. She went to every state and began speaking and rallying the troops for women's suffrage. And in 1871, using her own money, she began a national convention in Washington, D.C. This is what she wrote in her autobiography of that momentous occasion. In the year 1871, I organized a national convention in Washington at my own expense for the purpose of calling the attention of Congress to the fact that women were already citizens of the United States under the Constitution interpreted by the Declaration of Independence and only needed recognition by that body to become voters. I opened a large volume for the signatures of women willing to sign the following declaration. Declaration and pledge of the women of the United States concerning their right to and use of the electric franchise. We, the undersigned, believing that the sacred rights and privileges of the citizenship in this republic have long been guaranteed to us by the original constitution of the United States and that these are now made manifest in the 14th and 15th amendments so that we can no longer refuse the solemn responsibilities thereof. Do hereby pledge ourselves to accept the duties of the franchise in our several states so soon as all legal restrictions are removed. And believing that character is the best safeguard of national liberty, we pledge ourselves to make the personal purity and integrity of candidates for public office the first test of fitness. And lastly, believing in God as the supreme author of the first American Declaration of Independence, we pledge ourselves in the spirit of that memorable act to work hand in hand with our fathers, husbands, and sons for the maintenance of those equal rights on which our Republic was originally founded, to that end that it may have what is declared to be the first condition of just government, the consent of the governed. You see, to her, she had an entirely new argument for suffrage. She believed she already had the right to vote, as she was a citizen under the United States, as declared by the Declaration of Independence in 1776. She believed so much so in this that she convinced other women that they were already allowed to vote. She continued to press this issue in Congress until it all came to a head in 1872. She, along with Susan B. Anthony and several other win women, stormed the gates at the polling booths in the election. She pressed onward and attempted to cast her vote. Security tackled her to the ground, but Susan B. Anthony managed to press her way through. She cast her vote and was promptly arrested. Isabella managed to escape, weaseling her way through security, but that was a momentous occasion in history. Of course, 
she grew on from that point to be a bit of a trailblazer and a bit more of a rabble rouser. It seems that that inspired her to take a more rebellious action towards the government. So in the 1880s, she began to take a more serious tone towards women's suffrage. She began to also believe in women's rights and she began to take on more radical ideas. She took up the mantle of police reformation. She believed that there was an immediate need for female officers and that the entire system was corrupt. She also believed that there needed to be female superintendents, who we now call commissioners. In fact, she called for the New York City commissioner to be a woman. This was widely mocked. And I would say who's laughing now, but there has still never been a female commissioner for New York City. Now, of course, she was ridiculed in places like New York for that statement. She was also ridiculed in Chicago, but she had great support right here in Connecticut. The Hartford Current, which still runs today, would always publish anything she had to say, whether it be a letter, whether it be a statement from when she was at home, whether it be when she was abroad giving speeches, or if she was giving a statement to Congress. There were great supporters here in Connecticut, especially in New England, not counting New York, <laughs> which of course is not part of New England anyway, we forget about them. So she was someone who had great support here. Connecticut was a huge supporter of women's suffrage, so we are very happy to have her. But of course, all good things must come to an end. Unfortunately, as age did catch up to her, and as age caught up to her sister, she did have to stop her touring. Harriet Beecher Stowe was very close to her. They probably were the closest out of all the siblings. And so as Harriet grew older, she actually ended up getting Alzheimer's. Isabella was the one to take care of her in her elderly age. And in 1896, she was the one by her bedside when she passed away. Today, the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center is still alive and well. You can go online and take a look at their collections. They're not open right now, but you can take a look. They do tell the story of Isabella along with Harriet, so I would encourage you to take a look at that because she has such an incredible story to tell. She did make her last appearance in Congress in 1893 when she was an elderly woman. She did manage to persuade several senators to vote for suffrage, which is a pretty impressive feat in 1893. And in 1901, she managed to persuade several people in the Connecticut General Assembly as well. But in 1907, as you can see, she did pass away. She had a stroke. And unfortunately, she was just 13 years away from seeing the 19th Amendment. Now, this is a very special time for us because we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And it's a really special time to celebrate women like her because without her hard work, without her passion, without her dedication, we would not have the freedoms that we have today. Without these women who fought for us, we would not be celebrating this 100th anniversary. And I think we owe it to her to tell her story and to also champion other women who are doing the work to this day.